One of the awesome things is um, God is faithful, amen? God is faithful, and uh, today uh, we're going to continue on probably the longest series I've ever done, the Decalogue. We're going to continue, and I just want to say, fasten your seatbelts. We're about to get, it's about to get serious right now. <laughs> All right, so we're on the last four, and uh, we're going to be looking at the Decalogue. And if you have your Bibles, book of Deuteronomy chapter 5, and when you get there, say amen. How many appreciate all that God has done inside of our lives? Yes. Amen. Yes. And um, God is moving on our behalf. Uh, even today after our service, I'm so thankful that the Royal Rangers are going to be giving us out free snow cones outside of our service. I want to thank uh, Joseph Salsi for setting that up. But uh, we're going to be having a great time after our service. So book of Deuteronomy, when you get there, say amen when you're in chapter 5. And we're going to go to verse 6. Appreciate all those who are here for the first time and those who are watching online. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, we want to say thank you for tuning in today. We're praying for you, believing God for you. But if we could all stand today, if you're in your home, if you could stand in honor of God's word. And book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 6, the Bible says like this. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have any other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down and worship to them. Do not serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for their father's iniquity to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. But showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Be careful to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God. As you are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work. You, your sons, your daughters, your male or female slaves, your ox, your, your donkey or any of your livestock are the resident alien who lives within your city gates so that your male and female slaves may rest as you do. Verse 15, remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord has commanded you so that you may live a long and prosperous life in the land the Lord your God has given you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give dishonest testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's wife or desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male or female slave, his oxen or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. While we go ahead and pray, Lord, we thank you for today. I pray, Lord, that I would decrease and that you would increase. I pray that your love would touch our hearts. I pray that your power would transform our minds. And I pray that today will be a day that we're reset, recalibrated, Lord, touched by you. I pray it would be a day, Lord, that you just strengthen our hearts and lives and that your name is glorified, your name is honored, and we love you, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. So today we're going to be looking at the commandment. Um, and we've been talking about the Decalogue. We, we looked at the first uh, four commandments that dealt with our relationship to God. And now we're going to be looking at our relationship with others. We're going to continue along that vein. And we were looking at uh, how God told us that we cannot murder because we're created in God's image. Our, our lives are sacred before the Lord. And we talked about that the last time we, we looked through the Decalogue. And today we're going to be looking at uh, relationships that you and I have in, in the relationship of marriage where God has commanded us to not commit adultery. Now as you think about that commandment, you might say, well, Pastor Danny, I'm not married, so this doesn't apply to me. Well, I want to tell you that when Jesus talked about adultery, he talked about sexual sin in general as well. And so when you think about sexual sin, a lot of people say, oh, that's only people that, that are married. No, it's even for you that are single. Because someday you are going to get married. And someday um, you are going to marry that spouse that you've been praying for, you've been been believing God for, and you want to be ready in doing all the things that God has commanded you to do. Now, jump with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. And 
And we're going to go to verse 4. And when you get there, say amen. And Jesus said these words. He says, haven't you read that he created them in the beginning, both male and female? And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, Jesus, he begins to show God's ideal for marriage. He says, you know what? The ideal that God started in the book of Genesis chapter 3 is that a man is going to leave his father and his mother. All of a sudden, he's going to be united to his wife, and his wife's going to be number one in that relationship. Not the mom no more. Not the dad no more for the daughter. But all of a sudden, the husband, the Bible says that they're going to become one flesh. And the Bible says, you know what, they're going to leave their father and mother's house. And all of a sudden, they're going to be united with their wives. Now, this was God's ideal found in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 24, where God says, hey, this is my ideal. Now, marriage is a sacred union. It's a holy union that is God-ordained for the building of a what? A fruitful and holy society. And the reason why God has created marriage is marriage, as you look at marriage, you study marriage, it's a building block for what? For God's kingdom. God created marriage so we can be in fellowship uh, with your spouse. God created marriage for procreation. Um, of another generation, of raising up a godly offspring to honor and cherish the Lord. And that's, that was God's ideal from the beginning. Then all of a sudden, sin came in. And when sin came in, uh, we go to the garden and we see that there was a forbidden fruit there. And I want to tell you that every single one of you, no matter if you're married or you're single, you're in covenant relationship with Jesus. And what I mean by that is this, is that you're married to the Lord. You're married to the Lord. Not just, this is not just for married people. This is for all of us who are in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we're in covenant relationship with the Lord, and all of a sudden that means you're married to Jesus. You single sisters are married to Jesus. What a beautiful thing. And you, you single brothers, you're married to the Lord Jesus. You know the song, I keep falling in love with him over and over as the days go by, right? So there's a forbidden fruit that's out there in every single one of our lives because every single one of us will get tempted with sin. There's no one here that's exempt from that. Let's get that clear. There's no one here that's, you know, you're super, you're superhuman and you are never tempted. If you believe that, you are fooled, brother. You are fooled, sister. You have pride in your life. And so today I want to tell you, you're in covenant relationship with the Lord, and there's a forbidden fruit that's coming and trying to tempt you and I to give in. And a lot of times that forbidden fruit has to do with sexual sin. Sexual sin. Jesus, he took us back to the garden. He talked about this forbidden fruit. So you're in covenant relationship with the Lord. I'm in covenant relationship with the Lord. You and I, we're in holy matrimony with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God has called us to live holy lives. God has called us to live sanctified lives. If you've made mistakes, God has, you know what, you turn to the Lord, you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. You're forgiven by the power of God. I don't care what sin you've ever done. God can forgive you of all those sexual sins. If you're bound by homosexuality, if you're bound by pornography, if you're bound by infidelity, adultery, fornication, all of those things. I want to tell you that God, he wants to set you free. And he wants to give you power to walk in purity and righteous living. Now, you think about this text and Jesus, he's saying... From the beginning, the ideal was for a man and a woman to be together for their lifetime. All of a sudden, sin, it creeped in. Sin came into the garden, 
Men began to fall into sins. Women began to fall into sin. And this sin, what it began to do is affect the lives. You think about all the consequences of sexual sin. You think about all of them. And, and some, of them, some people think about all the consequences of sexual sin, and they're still involved in sexual sin. Why? Because it's a bondage. It's a bondage. They think, oh, I can get AIDS. They think, oh, I'm going to destroy my marriage. They think, oh, I'm going to destroy my kid. They think about all these things, and they're still involved in sexual sin. And that brings us to the question, why, why do people do that? Don't they love their wife? Don't they, love, don't they love their kids? Don't they love? Because our sin affects everyone that's around us. Our sin affects our children. Our sin affects uh, uh, the community of believers that we're around. Our sin can even affect our future. And so you're thinking about all these things, all, all these things right now. You say, okay, well, what does that mean? Why do I not want to be involved in sexual sin? Well, let me say this. The main reason that will keep us close to Jesus and keep us going forward for the Lord, guess what it is? It's not just thinking about the consequences. It's not just thinking about, you know, uh, man, this is going to happen to me. That bad thing is going to happen to me. I'm going to have a bad reputation and all those things. You know what will keep us from sexual sin? It's found in the book of Genesis chapter 39 in the life of Joseph. And Joseph, he was in a place in his life where this woman kept on coming after him, Potiphar's wife, and she told him, no, not discreetly, she said, sleep with me. The Bible says that he was well built and handsome like all you brothers here. And let's just come on, let's play both sides of this because there's men on the prowl too. There was a man, let's imagine that Potiphar going after a, a woman who was in love with God, and the Bible says that she said, or he said, sleep with me. And the Bible says that Joseph said something so interesting. He said, God, he said, how can I do such a wicked thing and sin against my God? Now, you think about that. What keeps us walking in a pure life is not just our love for others, but it's our love for God. Our love for God. I love God, I love you, God, and I don't want to ruin this relationship. I want to be in love with you, Lord, and I don't want anyone to come in between this relationship. And how many of you know that sex, if sex made people happy, prostitutes would be the most happiest people in the world? Sex can destroy people's lives. It's like fire, right? It's like fire, and if it's uncontrolled, it's going to devastate everything. And Jesus, God, he ordained sex. He created sex to be in the bonds of marriage. Imagine a fire pit of covenant that there's this fire pit and the, that fire could stay right there between one man and one woman for their lifetime. But if that fire gets out of that fire pit, it can cause damage to its surroundings. See, Jesus has ordained one man, one woman for their lifetime to be in that covenant relationship. And in that place, God allows sex as a beautiful thing for the procreation and fellowship of one man and one woman for their lifetime. That is, the, that is the design of God. That's God's design. It's nothing else. That's God's design. You might say, well, that sounds so old-fashioned, and Jesus was old-fashioned, or, or Jesus was, uh, you know, maybe Jesus was liberal. You know, Jesus, when it comes to sexual ethics, Jesus was very conservative. Conservative. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, in verse 27, he says these words. It says, you have heard that it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone that looks at a woman or a man, how about we could put a man there too, that looks at someone lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, if your phone causes you to sin, if your computer causes you to sin, if that side of town causes you to sin, if that Instagram, if that TikTok, if that Snapchat causes you to sin, throw it away for it's better for you to lose your social media than have your whole body thrown into hell. Cut it off and throw it away for it's better for you to lose one of your social media platforms than have all of them thrown into hell. 
we're just being real right now. We're just keeping it real. I said, let's put on our safety belts. Things are going to get really serious. Jesus said, hey, they said in the Old Testament, hey, don't commit adultery. I say, don't even look at somebody lustfully. He says, let's take it another level. Don't even look at someone lustfully. Don't even, don't even look at a man with his shirt off. Don't even look at a woman when she's dressed in, a way, in an inappropriate way. Don't even do that. Us men, us women of God that are in covenant relationship with, in your marriage, you have to control your eyes. You have to run from temptation. For you that are here and you're saying, I'm not married, guess what? You're going to get married someday, and you want to save yourself for that person. You think about Joseph when he ran out of Potiphar's house. We think about that. Okay, he's probably like 23, 24 years old. He runs out of the house. The Bible says he runs out, and he ran out of there naked. I believe he was in his Hebrew boxers. I don't know. He ran out of that house, but if he would have gave in, you got to think his mom and dad weren't there. His mom was already dead. His dad, Jacob, was hundreds of miles away, and he really had no reason to be living a pure life because he was living by himself. But what he did is he ran out of that place, and as he ran out of that place, he ran into his destiny because we know that Joseph was the prince of Egypt about 13 years, 12 years later, and guess what happened when he got ordained as the prince of Egypt? Guess what happened? They gave him a wife. They gave him a wife. God was protecting his wife for years. I want you to think about that. See, when you're running from temptation, you're thinking about your future spouse. You're thinking about your future kids. You're thinking about your future grandkids. You're thinking about your destiny. You're thinking about all these things. And that's why it's so important that you run, that I run, that we all run. When temptation comes our way, because it's going to come our way, knocking on our door, maybe today, maybe this week, it might be when you're home alone on your computer or going to sleep with your phone or maybe at that school or at your job. Whenever it comes, my encouragement is to run. Let's run like Joseph did. Now, where does uh, sexual sin originate? Jump with me to the book of Mark. And when you get there, say amen, chapter 7. Book of Mark, chapter 7. And um, we're going to go to verse 20, book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 20. And um, the Bible says this. It says, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within, for from within, out of a people's hearts come evil thoughts. Everyone say evil thoughts. Sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the person. Now, the word that's used here for sexual immorality is the word por pornania. And that's the Greek word where we get the, the word pornography from. And in this word is used also in the book of 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, it's used in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 3, where the Bible says, be sanctified. Turn to your neighbor and say, get sanctified. How many of you ever knew a lusty person? You're all, pastor, I was them. We could be honest. We're in the house of the Lord. We have all had our battles. And... There's that spirit of lust that wants to come in, take over uncleanliness inside of our life, in our thoughts, in our heart, in our surroundings. And what does God command us to do is to be sanctified. That means to be holy. That means to be set apart. Is it something that can happen to anyone? Yes. If you ask God, God, sanctify my heart, there's so much things going on in this heart, and we can be real with God. God, these are things that have taken place in my life. Lord, help me. Give me your strength and your grace that I can be a sanctified Christian. The Bible says, be sanctified, for this is the will of God. And the word that's used in that text is pornania again. It says, be sanctified and do not indulge in pornania. In pornania, and what that means is unlawful sexual activity, which is so many things. Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, masturbation, 
pornography, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Now you might say, well, Jesus never specifically mentioned some of these things. Well, Jesus never specifically mentioned kidnapping, but we know that it's wrong. So when you think about all these things, you're like, okay, God, um, what, what's the root? The root of it is our heart is wicked. And our heart needs to be guarded. And our heart needs to come into a place where it's like, God, help me. And you might say, well, what? you know, Danny, I'm not married. I'm 23 years old, and I'm in the prime of my life. Like, really? Come on, you're so old-fashioned. Well, let me talk to you one more time, okay? Jump with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want you to know you're valued. I want you to know your value, okay? I want you to tell yourself right now, I'm valuable to God. See, I want you to know you're loved by God. You're loved by God. You're loved by Him. And when you know you're loved by Him, it helps you and I to be those Sons and daughters that God has called us to be. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 13, it says this. It says, food is for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, Paul's talking to the church in Corinth, and they're coming up with some excuses to him because Corinth was a very wicked city. It's full of idolatry, and there was a bunch of pagan temples where there was rampant uh, prostitution there in this city. As the men were walking to church, they were walking in front of all these places. As the women were walking to church, they are walking in front of all these places. And what some of the men were saying, is said, hey, food is for the body, I eat food. And they're basically saying, sex is for the body, I'm going to have sex. And they're kind of trying to come under, hey, it's permissible, I'm under grace, and I'm under all of this. And Paul says, hey, let me break it down about how valuable you are to Jesus. And let me break it down to you that there's some sins that have a bigger price tag than others. Let's be real. Like today, if I went to the store and I robbed a 10, a 10 cent candy, I'm probably not going to go to jail. But if I go to Bank of California tomorrow and I try to rob them, and I do rob them, and I do get caught, I'm going to prison for 25 years. They're the same sin. They're stealing, but there's different consequences. Sexual sin, there's different consequences. There's some of the heaviest consequences. The Bible says this. It says... However, the body is not for sexual immorality, pornania. It's not for pornania, but it's for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God raises up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? Wow. So should I take part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone who joins a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh, but anyone who's joined to the Lord is one in spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who sins sexually uh, in sexual immorality, he sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you when you've, uh, you have from God? whom you have from God, you are not your own. You are not your own. I am not my own. This is not Danny's body. I belong to God. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, you belong to God, and you're valuable to God. Turn to your other neighbors and say, you can't do whatever you want with your body. Let me give you an example. As I was praying for this sermon, I said, Lord, help me with this sermon. I know this sermon is going to be a hard sermon. And I said, Lord, give me a revelation so I can bring this one home, of this text. And you know what God showed me? I took my car to the car wash today. I cleaned it up. It's been dirty lately, so I went in and I cleaned it. I know some of you have been seeing my car dirty. I've been waiting for you to wash it for me, but, you know, <laughs> I'm just playing. But I took it in, and I said, okay, this, I have the title for this car. I paid for it. I remember giving the man the check right there, title, paid. It's my car. And if you came to me and said, Pastor Danny, can I borrow your car? You know what I'd have to say? I would have to say yes to you. And I would. And I'd say, yes, you can use my car. 
But as you're taking my car, you're going to know this car is not my car. This is Pastor Danny's car. But if you're out there and you're driving 130 miles down the freeway and you're just, you're just, you know, letting my tires get bald and you're not putting oil in my car and, you know, someday you're going to have to bring that car back to me because it's my car. I have the title. And I look at that car and I'm going to say, hey, this was bought with the price. I paid for it. You didn't. I entrusted you with this, but you did not value it. Now, I want you to transpose that to your body. It's not our own. We belong to God. We were bought by the title deed of the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that Jesus, he paid for us on Calvary, every sin, everything that we've done, he paid for it. And we're not our own, our body, our mind, our eyes, our hearts, even your private parts are not your own. Wow, that's deep. They're God's. They're God's. They belong to God. And we are called to live sanctified lives before him. You and I as people of the Lord, we're called to live sanctified lives before the Lord. When I was like six years old, or eight years old, uh, I was abused by an older girl. And it brought a lot of confusion to me. And I didn't tell my mom about it until I was already married. And it was brought hurt, confusion, pain, shame, guilt. I remember going to sleep at night crying, crying. And the enemy tried to destroy my life, my purity at a very young age, six or eight years old. Six and then again when I was eight years old. And I'm saying that I'm being very transparent to you because some of you say, man, pastor, you've never went through anything. You've never had any battles. No, I think we're all in the battle together. But I want to say this as, as a man of God, and I can say in purity and righteousness that by God's grace that he's given me the strength to what? To live a pure life. A pure life. When I surrender my life to God, forgive me of my sins. It transformed my life, my heart as a young man. And I want to say to you today, if you're here today, you're battling sexual sin. You say, man, I was molested. I was hurt. Someone exposed me to pornography, a teacher, a coach, uh, someone I trusted. I want to say that God wants to give you freedom. God wants to give you healing. God wants to give you victory. God wants to help you inside of your life to live that pure life. That pure life. And yesterday as I was preparing this sermon and I was, as I was just going over my notes, I was praying last night and I seen this monster in here. And it was a, it was a monster of pornography here. It was here and it was going through the rows. It was going through the rows. And this sermon was one of the hardest sermons I ever had to prepare. I'm working on the sermon. I'm working on the sermon. I just felt so much opposition, so much opposition. I'm like, God, why? God, why? And you know what I know in my heart is because your destiny. Your destiny. I don't care if you've made mistakes. Today's the day that God sets you free. Today's the day that you get help, that you get strength. That, that you get the, that grace that you need inside of your life by the power that God has held me with. It's not just for Danny, it's for you too. You just got to be real with God. So today I want to close with this, your purity plan, your plan of sexual purity. This is for married couples. This is for single cu uh, singles. For those who desire to get married someday. Your plan, do you have a plan for retirement? Many of you say, yes, I do. But how many have a plan for sexual purity? You might say, well, I made too many mistakes. That's what the devil is going to tell you, okay? See, God, he's in the business of reconciliation and restoration. He can take something that's broken and make it beautiful. You might say, I, you know, my marriage is, is, is torn apart. I want to tell you that there's two elements in that marriage God can bring healing. The two elements are repentance and forgiveness. There has to be those two, and God can do a miracle. God can do, I've seen God do that miracle. I've seen God do that miracle. But there has to be repentance and forgiveness. 
repentance and forgiveness. Repentance saying, I am turning from this sin and I'm going to God. And then also has to be forgiveness from the person who was hurt. Your plan for sexual purity today is going to be a plan that God uses to bring you into your destiny because you're valuable to God. The first thing that I want to talk about, your plan for sexual purity. You ready for this one? Four things. You ready? The first plan is this. You got to spend time with God every day. Every day. Every day. We have to say, God, I'm here again. I repent of my sin, Lord. Lord, strengthen me. We have to pray. We have to read the Bible. It's so critical, church. We can't let the devil lie to us and say, hey, it doesn't matter. You can, you can take a, a vacation for a few days. Guess what? The devil doesn't take a vacation. He works every day, okay? He works every day. So if you're going to take a vacation, you need to keep on praying during that vacation. You need to keep on reading the Bible. I don't care if you're all the way in Tennessee. You go find yourself a good church on that Sunday, and you go to church, Okay? You go to church, you read your Bible, you fast while you're on vacation for one meal at least, okay? Because the devil does not take a vacation. You got to spend your personal time with the Lord because there's a battle. Whether you have uh, uh, the battle of homosexuality or the battle of pornography or the battle of infidelity, you have all these battles going in you because the heart is wicked. Okay, so you have these battles. You have to spend time with God and say, God, give me a heart transplant. Let me be born again, delivered. If you've opened your, any doors to the enemy, you need to get prayer for deliverance. Renounce those things that you've done. Renounce them. Say, God, I renounce this. I renounce it, God. Any doors you might have opened, say, I renounce it in the mighty name of Jesus. And get prayer from the elders. The laying on of hands with oil. Lord, bring healing to this person's life. The second thing, and this is for singles, for married people, is set boundaries, walls around yourself from the, whatever temptation you may be facing. Set boundaries. Set boundaries around yourself. One of the things that I thank God for is that my wife, she's always there and she's always checking my phone. She said, let me see your phone. Oh, here's my phone. I get happy when I give it to her. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I don't got nothing to hide. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. I remember years ago, I was outreaching in, in a city, and I seen this boyfriend and girlfriend walking down the street. They're like 20 years old. And she's all, give me your phone. He's all, no. She says, I'll give me your phone. And he's all, no, no, you're not going to get my phone. You're not. And I see, and I said, oh, God, thank you that I'm not that guy. Lord, thank you, Lord, for that. And you appreciate it. And you know what? I, I appreciate the single men here that come up to me and say, Pastor, you can grab my phone anytime. And you can look at it. Because they're accountable. They're taking it seriously. Okay? So you got to set up boundaries. Never be with the opposite sex alone or with anyone who tempts you alone. Never. Never. Set up a boundary. Make it a group environment. Don't go jogging with that coworker. A lot of times things look innocent, but the devil, he starts things off innocently. You ready for the next one? Next one is this. Do not allow the internet to lure you in to a relationship. You're going to see your old flames on Facebook. You're going to see your old girlfriends on Instagram. You're going to see all this, and you know what? The enemy is going to come your way. You have to know what triggers you. You have to know your triggers. If you know that you shouldn't have the phone late at night, what did Jesus say? If your hand causes you sin, cut it off. I believe today that we need to have accountability in our lives. With our phones. Because you're valuable to God. And you know what? I'm going to be really open with you guys, okay? Here we go. You guys ready for this one? There never comes a point in your life where you don't need accountability. There never does. You know, you know Billy Graham, in 1946 or 1947, he wrote this manifesto. And the manifesto was something that he made as a safeguard to keep him 
save for his ministry. And you know Billy Graham, he had a very fruitful, great, accountable ministry. But you know what he did in that manifesto? He said, I'll never be with a woman alone. And I'm always going to travel with men. Everywhere I go preach, there's going to be men there with me. And that's a principle that you and I should adapt inside of our life. To never be alone. To never be alone. And you might say, man, Pastor Daniel, but I want to show that I'm strong. You know, Jesus, when he sent out the disciples, did he ever send them out one by one? No. He sent them out two by two. Two by two. You think about Paul and Silas, Paul and Timothy, Paul and John Mark. He always sent them out two by two because God, that's how he rolls. He rolls with accountability. And so you think about this. Right now inside of our lives, Billy Graham, he set up this manifesto. When he would go to a hotel, he would have men go into the hotel room just in case there was a woman in there waiting for inside his hotel room. Talk about accountability. He went to be with the Lord a few years ago, but he lived, what, a faithful life. I think in that place we can never think, oh, I'm just a kid. I need to be accountable. Oh, I'm just... Man, I'm just so weak. I need to be accountable. Oh, I'm just so, I'm, I just give in to all my temptations. I need to be accountable. No, all of us need accountability in our life. It, it's not a matter of weakness. It's a matter of wisdom. It's not weakness. It's wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom foresees danger. And what does it do? It sets up boundaries and safeguards inside of our lives. As the worship team makes their way up here today, I remember working for a man's house years ago. I was working for this man's house, and he was a millionaire. And I said, oh, I got to ask him this question. How did you do it? How did you become a millionaire? So what happened was I finally got a moment, seeing him there. I said, sir, how did you do it? We were building an airplane hangar for him. It was a garage for his airplane, basically. How did you do it, sir? He goes, well, you know what, <laughs> thought about it. What I did was when my, my friends started having midlife crises, 40 years old, and they started going with younger women, I just stuck with my wife. He said, now those guys are broke. He said, I just stuck it out. I just continued to hold on. He said, now me and my wife... We're at this place. But you know, the reality is this, church, is that every single one of us, the enemy will tempt us with sexual sin. Every single one of us here today. It might be while you're on your phone. It might be at, at school. It might be at work. It might be on Instagram. It might be when you're all alone. But in that moment, you have a choice to make, a decision to make. And in that moment, the Bible says that God hears the cry of his children. So in that moment, you can run to your sin. But the Bible promises a, a way of escape for us. And he said, I will not allow you to be tempted more than you can bear. See, the devil will say, hey, it's too strong of a temptation. You're going to give in. Come on, just give in. But God says, no, I'm going to make a way of, ex of escape. And I will also, what, won't give you more than you can handle. So in that moment of temptation, as you're watching online, maybe you're watching, you know what you can do? You can say, Jesus, I need you right now, God. I need your help and your strength in this because, Lord, I'm weak right now, and I need your help and your strength. And you might say, Pastor Danny, I've done too many things. I've made too many mistakes. I looked at, you might say, I looked at stuff last night I shouldn't have looked at. I, I feel so shameful, so guilty. Maybe you're a man. Maybe you're a woman. Maybe you've been battling this for a very long time. You know what I want to tell you? I want to say that God, he loves you. His grace is more than enough for you. You think about the book of John chapter 4, the woman at the well. The Bible says Jesus came to this woman at the well. And that woman, she didn't have one husband, two husbands, three husbands. She had five husbands. 
She went searching and searching through this relationship, that relationship, and she was still at a well. And Jesus said, you know what? I will give you living water and you'll never thirst again. The Bible says, it declares in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 36, and he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. The Bible says that we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. But you might say, how do I get this freedom? Well, you got to be real with God. And you got to be real with someone you trust. Not someone that's going to take your business all over the place, but a man of God, a woman of God. For you men, a man. For you sisters, a woman. Share your heart. Share your struggles so they can pray for you. And you know what you're going to see? By faith in Jesus, you're going to see deliverance come to your life. By faith in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're going to see God do a miracle because he's a miracle working God. How many of you here today, you've been set free. You've seen God work in this way in your life. You can say amen, 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 amen. And some of you, you're saying, man, pastor, I want to be in that place. The good news is this. God has no favorites, and he's going to touch you. Just cry out to him with all of your heart and all of your soul. This morning, if this message out with you in any way, are you here and you want to give your life to the Lord? Say, you know what? I want my sins forgiven. I want to be forgiven by the power of Jesus. I want to be forgiven by God. And you're here today with no one looking around. Just raise your hand right where you're at. Say, yes, I would like Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I want my sins forgiven. I want to join God's family. I want to be set free. You're watching online. Maybe you want to be, you want to join God's family. You want your sins forgiven. Say these words with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died and that you rose again on the third day. From this day forward, my life is yours. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you said that prayer, chat in the comments. Let us know who you are. We want to send some information your way. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God. God's going to do something great right now. I said it. God's going to do something great right now. Today, I want you all to stand right now in this place. You want to come to the altar, you can. But I want to raise my hands today, and I'm going to, I'm going to pray a prayer over you as a man of God, over over the God's people. I want to pray this prayer and I want you to just raise your hands today. Oh Jesus, hallelujah, here we go. As a man of God, as a man walking in purity and righteousness by the power of Jesus Christ, I decree, declare, Lord, that you would set captives free from condemnation, discouragement, and shame right now. Lord, and I pray you release a spirit of purity, God. Let us walk in sanctification, holiness, righteousness, joy of the Holy Ghost. Lord, let us run to you when we're tempted with sin. Let us run to you, God, when we want to throw in the towel. I pray you deliver right now people from homosexuality, from masturbation, pornography, adultery, every sexual sin by the power of Jesus and the authority invested in me. As a man of God, I pray you release your spirit in a mighty way. Transformation, breakthrough of the Holy Ghost supernatural increase supernatural blessings lamb of god healing breakthrough holy ghost power and anointing in the mighty name of jesus and right now i bind the spirit of pornography lord right now god i pray you set up a wall a wall of protection over these young people, these older people, no matter their age. The enemy is at war against us, Lord. 
I pray you set up a wall, God, of protection and deliverance of the Holy Ghost, God. Let us set up boundaries of accountability, Lord. I pray right now against you, spirit of pornography, in Jesus' name, I cast you out out of every home, out of phones right now. I come against you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray in Jesus' name uh, that you would release, God, a spirit of freedom and liberty, God, uh, over every person battling that spirit, Lord, right now. Because as your word says, he who the Son sets free uh, is free indeed, and that no weapon formed against us shall prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh man, I feel a battle going on right now. Christians praying in the spirit, hallelujah. Oh, Right now, by your power, your anointing. Oh, hallelujah. Right now, repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm more than a conqueror through you. I lay down my guilt. I lay down my shame. From this day forward, do your sanctifying work in my heart. Lord, help me to fall in love with you. Let me never forget, God, my first love is you and only you, God. Lord, right now, raise up a standard against the enemy over my life. I give, I give you everything right now, Lord. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. From this day forward, God, I'd walk in purity. I'd walk in accountability. I'd walk in the fear of the Lord. I'd walk in righteousness, not legalism, but grace, Lord, upon grace, Lord, to accomplish your will for my life. And all of God's people said, let's worship the Lord today. Let's give him glory. Oh, Lord, we praise your holy name, God.